Hi, this is Jim Salfer with the University of Minnesota Extension in St. Cloud. And today I'm going to spend some time talking about the topic of automatic milking systems or robotic milking systems and is it really the right choice for you on your farm. I'd also like to thank Dr. Marcia Endres. She's at the University of Minnesota also in St. Paul. And over the last number of years we've done a lot of projects on farm projects, visiting a lot of farms with automatic milking systems, doing extensive surveys with those farms and then also collecting data off their uh, milking systems taking a lot of barn measurements. And so today I'm going to present some of that information, but a lot of this will really be our observations and some of our surveys and visiting with farms on what really they thought was the key to making these automatic milking systems successful. First of all, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the potential advantages of automatic milking systems. And of course, these milking systems, since they're all computerized, take over 100 measurements at every cow on every single milking. And so there's just a vast array of information that's available. And so that really has the potential to allow you to make some real timely decisions when it comes to management your cows. Of course, there are many other benefits. It's a very consistent milking routine versus having to train milkers. And you may have higher quality milkers and lower quality milkers that might be milking your cows. I, it may be potentially you can have a higher skilled labor that is, spends more time managing cows and looking at computers and looking at data and analyzing that data. Of course, the other obvious ones are never late for work. They really don't need a lot of training and they really don't need a lot of time off. Of course, along with advantages, there are some potential disadvantages, uh, at least the potential ones. We would all hope that the, all of these systems are plug and play systems that work well every day. Of course, anytime you're dealing with technology, that may not be the situation. We just hope they don't end up being plug and pray systems or maybe plug and pay systems. Another item to think about as you're looking at installing automatic milking systems is what might be your potential return on investment as compared to other milking systems. And this may vary a lot depending on what other milking systems you're looking at and how you compare those. But it's just something to consider as you move forward in making an investment. The other concerns maybe you want to be thinking about long term is will these systems eventually become obsolete? Um, I don't think the milking part of them, I think they'll be milking cows for a long time. The first commercial unit that was installed in 1992 is still milking cows, but I would assume that the technology associating with that is continuing to change. But again, that doesn't mean that a five or six or seven year old system may not work perfectly fine. You may have to think a little bit about that if you want to stay up to date and when you might need to replace that system. The other number one concern we heard from producers as we went around is what are the repair costs going to be long term in these systems. So uh, I know most of the systems that are installed are reasonably new, new yet, particularly in North America and the United States, but that's something to really be thinking about long term that you may have the potential to have higher repair costs compared to other milking systems. Probably the best quote we had as we went around and visited farms, I think that summers, summarizes it up fairly well, is Doug Schmidt over in eastern Wisconsin. And he had the quote that management makes milk, robots only harvest it. And so along with this, I think if you're going to be really successful and happy in a robotic milking system or an automatic milking system, you really must like working with the cows. I think if the main thing that you want out of the barn is yourself, Robots really are not going to be a good choice for you because long term you're going to have less success and maybe more importantly you're going to really be frustrated with the system because it's not going to allow you to do that. So remember that cow management really still needs to come first in these systems and the farms that have the best success really enjoy working with cows and don't mind spending time out in the barn and really thinking about what they can do to maximize that system. These are some guidelines for efficiencies that the automatic milking systems put out or the robotic milking companies put out. These box systems will attach about 140 to 190 attaches per box for every 24 hours. So that's really about all the milkings you're going to get. There's some variation in there. Uh, ideally, most of the recommendations are about two and a half to three milkings per cow per day. But more importantly in these systems, what you really want to do is maximize the amount of milk per robot box that you get. And you see their guidelines here that four to 4,500 is a pretty good number. Ideally, you'd like to be above, above that 5,000 pounds of milk per robot per day. 
you can see this is the information off the computers on the farms. Some of the farms that we surveyed, our average on this groups of farms was 4,325 pounds per robot per day. And this was information collected every day for well over a year. And so it's just, just not a monthly or um, a daily average. This is a lot of information on all these robots. And you can see we have a couple of farms here that kind of struggled and only got about 3,000 pounds of milk per robot. But we did have about 10% of our farms that were right at 5,000 pounds of milk per robot or even above that number. It was kind of interesting when you looked at this data on pounds of milk per robot. Most of the herds that had a high number of pounds of milk per robot achieved that by getting a lot of pounds of milk per cow. But there was some farms, particularly guided flow barns, that had maybe a little less milk per cow, but they were able to push their cow numbers up. And so in reality, they got a quite a bit of pounds of milk uh, per robot by maybe a little less milk per cow, but more cows through the robot. When you look at pounds of milk per cow per day, we actually had a couple herds that averaged over 90 pounds of milk per cow per day over this entire period. And our top farm averaged about 97 pounds of milk per cow per day on an average over well over a year's period of time. So if these systems are managed right, you really can achieve fairly high milk production per cow per day. Another key to success in these systems is feed management. Uh, if you've talked to many people that have robotic dairies, that's one of the things that they intrigues them and it also frustrates them at the same time. Uh, one of the things we did as uh, part of our survey, we asked nutritionists and the farms, and these were the nutritionists that work with automatic milking system farms or robotic dairies, what they thought was some of the key to su successful feed management. And interestingly enough, both the producers and their nutritionists kind of came up with the same answers. And they both ranked feed management as the most important thing as far as successful uh, as far as successfully feeding a robotic milking system. And what we meant by that was consistent moisture or at least adjusting the ration consistently based on moisture if moisture changes. Um, consistent delivery, consistent mixing of the TMR, made sure it was spread out through the bunk fairly well. So that's what we meant by feed management. Uh, number two in our survey was pellet palatability and quality. What we meant by pal palatability of the pellet was um, just very palatable ingredients that the cows like to eat. So distiller's grain, soybean meal, maybe heat treated soybean meal, corn, those kind of products. And what we meant by pellet quality was really the hardness of the pellet so there weren't a lot of fines as the cows tried to eat that feed. Another thing I think that's important is make sure you work with a nutritionist that really likes the challenge of working with robots. There's some nutritionists that just really thrive and really enjoy working with automatic milking systems. There are other nutritionists that find it more of a challenge because you're dealing now with, of course, a PMR and trying to balance that PMR along with trying to feed cows through the robotic milking system. So some, some nutritionists, like anything, just really enjoy working with that system more than others. Uh, one of the challenges as we talk a little bit about nutrition is that when you look at any kind of feeding system, as a nutritionist your goal should be to uh, get good milk production, maintain cow health, you want it to be of course as economical as possible and you want it to be labor efficient. One of the challenges of course of an automatic milking system uh, or automatic milking system feeding system is that you've got an additional challenge of trying to entice those cows to mil visit the milking station on a regular basis and very frequently. And that's really of course accomplished through a PMR at the bunk or a partially mixed ration and then you feed additional concentrates at the milking station or at the robotic milking system. This is especially important in a free flow system. In a guided flow system you do have an advantage that you've got some selection gates that really help guide those cows toward the robot. And you see in my next slides there really is a different feeding philosophy on whether you've got a free flow system or a guided flow system as far as managing that feed uh, feed program. Another thing I'd like to talk on a little bit is feeding to meet your goals. As I've worked with a lot of producers starting up, uh, this it's really tricky to get this balanced. Again, particularly in a in a 
free flow system because if you feed a real high forage, real low energy diet in the bunk, that really does drive cows to the robot. But there may be some potential to limit milk production. I got some calls and these they were doing it to try to minimize the fetch cows and every time they decrease the energy in the bunk they tended to lose a little bit of milk and that's not too surprising since it's in most of our high producing cows it's really calories that limit our milk production. Of course on the flip side if we feed too much energy in that PMR at the bunk we tend to get these late lactation cows that kind of become lazy cows and tend not to visit the uh, the visit the robot system. You can see a slide or the, on the right side here some research that was done in Canada. I know it's a little bit older but I think it really describes fairly well what happens as you increase the energy in the bunk you tend to increase the percent of lazy cows and again by definition these lazy cows are really you could just as soon substitute fetch cows in there and so that really is something that's tricky to balance and so you've got to think a little bit about what your goals are if your goals are to maximize milk production per cow you might have to accept the fact that you're going to have a few more fetch cows particularly these late lactation cows if your goal really is to minimize the number of fetch cows that you have in your herd you might have to accept the fact that you may be hurting milk production just a little bit on some of those cows that are in that herd now that's going to change uh, our observations are as as you get really good milk production on an average so once your tank average gets up to 85 to 90 pounds I think you can do a really nice job of maybe both of both of those optimizing the number of fetch cows and also really getting excellent milk production out of all of your cows uh, now I'll skip over to maybe what our survey was looking at and what we ended up looking at for a daily concentrate feeding and this really does point out the difference in feeding philosophies between a free flow system and a guided flow system. Again you can see on our free flow barns the average number of pellets fed through the milking station was a little bit over 11 pounds of pellets per cow per day. When you look at the guided flow systems are considerably less. The only average to feeding about 8 pounds on an average 8 pounds of pellet per cow per day. But when you look at the big difference is a maximum number of pellets that are fed. So this is a maximum number of pellets that any single cow would get on any single visit. And when you look at that, maybe the maximum averages don't tell as much of a story as kind of um, kind of the general feeding philosophy on maximum number of pellets. There was only one free flow system, so only one system here that fed a maximum of more than 12 pounds of pellet to a cow. So all the other systems, really their maximum was less than 12 pounds of pellets per cow per day. When you look at our guided flow systems, there was only one herd that fed more than 12 pounds of pellets per cow per day. So really a difference in, in feeding philosophy between the two different systems. Similarly, we asked the nutritionists what the difference was between their PMR balance in the bunk versus the tank average. And again, you can see kind of that same trend that the free flow barns, they tended to feed for a lot lower production compared to the bunk average or the the balance of the PMR was quite a bit lower than the tank average compared to the guided flow barns and again this is kind of that feeding philosophy that most of the guided flow barns wanted to kind of minimize the amount of pellets that they fed through their automatic milking system and wanted to feed most of their feed through the bunk whereas the guided flow people tended to feed a lot more toward production in their automatic milking system and then it tended to feed a lot lower energy in their uh, in their PMR or in their bunk. When you look at feed costs that was a comment we heard a fair amount when we were visiting farms that their feed cost had, had gone up quite a bit. This is some information from Chad Kiefer on their farm. They've got five robot dairies and Chad also does diets for a lot of other uh, robotic milking system. He's a nutritionist by trade and you can see overall on an average there really isn't a lot of difference between a parlor system and a robotic milking system and when I look at the Finbin data through the University of Minnesota and sort that out by robotic farms and non-robotic farms I really kind of see the same trend that on an average there's really not a lot of difference. 
But if you look at Chad's chart here, I think it does a nice job of pointing out that your high producing cows, there really is a quite a bit higher feed cost in the automatic milking system. Part of that is you're feeding a lot more pellets to those cows. That tends to be a more expensive um, feed. But if you look on the flip side of it, your low producing cows, again, you're feeding them a lot more toward whatever their production is. Your feed cost is actually considerably lower with a robotic feeding system. And so I was thinking about why we maybe heard that from the producers. Part of it may be that when they put in their automatic milking system, the check that they're writing to their feed supplier is quite a bit higher than it was before. And also a lot of these farms that I talked about high feed costs were feeding high moisture corn in their PMR and they had uh, they fed a lot of high moisture corn in their other system that they had before they put in automatic milking systems. Many of those raise that high moisture corn. So now instead of harvesting that high moisture corn, just putting it in a silo or putting it in a bag and then grinding it and feeding it to the cows, they had to actually combine that corn, dry it, haul it to town, then it got put in a pellet which of course they had to pay for and then that got hauled back out. So in reality I think their feed cost maybe was up quite a bit higher than it maybe was in their previous system. So just as you're thinking about it that might be something for you to consider. But you remember the data really shows that feed costs are pretty similar between the two systems depending upon how you look at that uh, situation. Another thing that's discussed a lot with automatic milking systems is barn design. I think the keys to barn design is you want to have excellent cow comfort. You want to make sure cows really have good access to robots, whether that's crossovers or and areas in front of the robot. You want to try and minimize lameness in these barns. And then you also want to be thinking about any kind of labor saving design that you might put into your system. So remember the only thing, the only way automatic milking systems pay for for themselves is decreased labor. Now if you're going from 2x to 3x you're going to get a little bit more milk production but primarily your big driver in um, saving money in these systems or paying for these systems is really uh, is really with labor savings. This is this picture up here really shows what you'd like ideally is to have all of your cows that are lying down and so these cows that are standing up and maybe want to have access to the robot when a cow leaves really has free access and doesn't have to meander around and try and get through a whole group of cows. This is a free flow system. Many listeners or many uh, listeners may be very familiar with what these systems look like, but just for folks that might not be, free flow system basically means cows have the choice to do whatever they want whenever they want to do it. So they can lie down anytime they want, uh, they can stand up anytime they want, they can visit the robot anytime they want. And this is a really good system. The vast majority of the systems that are put in this area and I think worldwide are probably free flow systems. Uh, the reason the the reason you may not put in a free flow system or consider a guided flow system is that cows some cows really like visiting the robot. They like to think they can sneak in there and get a little bit of feed. Uh, we did hear on one farm that there were a couple of cows that had up to over 150 visits to the robot in a single day. Now, of course, they didn't get milk that many times. They were refused and kicked out of the robot. Uh, but some of the producers that put in guided flow systems really didn't want any cows to have access to the robot that were really not eligible to be milked. This is just an overview of a free flow system. As again, as you can see, uh, there's no impedance, there's no gates. These cows can have access to these robots whenever they choose. They can have access to feed whenever they'd like. They can have access to the beds anytime they'd like. This is a guided flow system with a feed first system. And so if you kind of follow the areas, this is the feed lane up here. You can see cows are up in, a, in the feeding area. In order for them to have access to the bedded area, they need to go through this guided floor, this sort gate right here. And when they go through this sort gate, if it identifies them as a cow that really needs to be milked, it will guide her into this commitment pen. And then in this commitment pen, she'll have to go to the robot and through a gate to get out. 
Uh, if it decides that she was just milked a couple of hours ago and her milking permission says she really doesn't need to be milked, she has free access to go back to the gates and lie down. And then you can see right here by number 5 and number 10, those are one-way gates that cows go through. So once they're in a bedded area, they can have free access to the feed area through this uh, through this one-way gate and then they can go up and eat and they just kind of tend to go around in that system. Uh, here's a here's a barn that has a, a feed first system and you can see I'm taking this picture from the feed lane and this is a selection gate or the sort gate that cows go through and then they're either sorted into this commitment pen by the robotic milking system or they're sorted back into the lying area over here. And um, one of the challenges of these systems that we saw, and we heard producers talk about it, we didn't have a lot of these systems in our survey, but we tend to feed fairly high energy PMRs. And as I mentioned earlier, that's one of the reasons people put in these guided flow systems to feed high energy in the bunk. Well, when cows would go up to this bunk, they'd fill up on feed. And so they really didn't have the drive to get to this robot and really go through the robotic system. They weren't really even hungry for the, the amount of feed that was fed in there. So producers complained, and we observed that a lot of cows tended to be standing around, maybe in this commitment pen, maybe in this feed lane. And so at least based on our observations, with our US system where we tend to feed a little higher energy in the bunk, this really maybe wouldn't be recommended. But if you want to feed a real low energy diet in the bunk, it seems like these systems maybe would work in that specific situation. This is a guided flow milk first system, which of course is basically just the opposite. Cows are in the lying area. You can see the sketch diagram. Here's the bedded pack area or the freestall area right here. This is that sort gate that the cows can go through. And so a cow goes through here. Again, if it's not time for her to be milked, she has free access to go to the feed lane over here. Or if it's time for her to be milked, she ends up in this commitment pen. And here's the robot right here. And so you can see she exits a robot. She goes through here. This isn't a sort pen. This is actually a foot bath. And so then after she exits a robot, she goes right back into the feed area. I really kind of like the design on this specific situation because many of these uh, guided flow milk first systems, these cows after they leave the, leave the robot, end up back into this commitment pen. I think this is really kind of a nice design where they exit that robot and there's actually a, a, a series of gates that actually guide them right back out into the feed lane because it really prevents a lot of cows clogging up this commitment pen area. Again, this is a picture of that same situation where cows are in this freestall area. They go through the selection gate right here. If it's time for them to be milked, this little gate swings open. You can see this cow is standing in the commitment pan waiting to, waiting to be milked. And then after she exits a robot, here's the lane that takes her back out into the feed area. So kind of a nice design system. This is kind of the difference that I see between the two systems. When you look at some of the data out of Canada, you can see obviously in a free flow system you will have more fetch cows because you don't have the commitment gates or the, the selection gates that help guide them toward the robot. So typically, at least in this particular survey, you're going to average about 16% in a free flow system, maybe about half of that in a guided flow system. Your initial investment is typically a little bit lower in a free flow system because you don't need those selection gates to help guide the cows. I think the level of management complexity is probably a little bit higher in a uh, in a guided flow system because in that system you really kind of have to keep track of where the cows are at because you could have a cow that ends up in that commitment pen for whatever reason she really doesn't want to go through the robot and so she could stand in there several hours and not have access to uh, not have access to feed and maybe not have access to a way to lie down so you've got to be thinking a little bit more about those systems in a guided flow system. Of course, on the flip side, the feeding complexity is quite a bit higher in that free flow system. And trying to get that energy balance just right is harder in a free flow system. And if you upset that, you, you, it could potentially affect your flow through the system a lot more. Whereas in a guided flow system, you do, the, you do have the advantage of these selection gates helping guide those cows into that milking area.
Some other keys to success from a facility standpoint, as I had mentioned earlier, you may, maybe you want to not overcrowd too much because there is at least some potential of limiting cow movement. There's some research that's been done that shows that lameness decreases visits and has a potential increase of the fetch rates. And again, you really do want to have excellent ventilation in your system, like any system, and minimize fly control. Because anytime you bunch cows in an area, it really does potentially have make it more difficult for cows to attend that milking station. One of the interesting questions we had as we went to a lot of farms is where to put the foot bath. And it sounds like really a simple question, but farmers really struggled in where to do that because there was a lot of discussion that they really didn't want to put it close to the robot because they really were afraid that it may potentially affect visits and you don't want anything around that robot area that will potentially impede visits. There are some farms that did what was shown up here on kind of the upper left or the left side of this picture is they put their foot bath away from the robots and maybe the end of the barn. Uh, of course the disadvantage of that is on a periodic basis typically two to three times per week they would have to walk all of their cows through through the foot bath they put up a series of gates now the farms that did that said it didn't take a lot of time it maybe took them 15 to 20 minutes per group but again you're putting in robotic systems to try and minimize some of that labor so as you're thinking about robot system just be very cognizant and think about how you want to manage this and two potential different ways to manage foot baths but one thing I will say is you really do need to install a foot bath because about a third of the farms that we surveyed um, did not use foot baths. We locomotion scored about a third of the cows in each of the pens and those farms actually had quite a bit higher lameness as you might expect than the farms that use foot baths on a regular basis. Some of the other nice labor saving devices that we saw on farms is up in the upper left hand corner here is a split entry pen and so this also served as a the fetch pen on this particular farm so you can see there's a pen back here kind of behind the robot and so when they use that for a fetch pen they chase cows back there and then close this particular gate but what's unique about a split entry you can see this gate right here and so when cows are back in this fetch pen they can have access to the robot right here but at the same time, cows in the main pen or the main barn out in front where I'm taking the picture can also swing this gate and have access to that robot at the same time. So when cows are in the fetch pen, it, it also allows cows from the main pen to visit that robot. Maybe a bigger advantage, and we saw this on a number of farms, if there's a farm, if there's a cow standing out right here that just happens to be chewing her cud and she tends to be a dominant cow or a fetch cow, that maybe, maybe limit the number of cows that really want to try and get by her and have access to this robot uh, if you don't have a split entry. In this situation, you can have a cow that would walk in this, and you can see this gate is open for most of the day, can kind of walk around, and she's got this gate to protect protect her from that boss cow and she can just walk into the robot around the back way so it really allows cows two different ways to access that robot and so I think that's really something whether it's a remodel or a new facility you really should be considering. Another thing that I kind of like in facilities is these drovers lanes whether you've got a robot barn or, or not a robot barn because I really think it it's really a huge advantage when you're trying to move cows. Uh, my observation is when you're trying to sort cows out of a pen uh, it typically takes about two or three people to do that and out of those three people, two of them will typically lose their religion before they get those cows sorted out. And so in this particular barn, they've got calving pens in the back. I'm taking a picture from kind of in front of the robot. And so in order to get those cows to the robot, they can just drive them up this drover's lane that's in front of the free stalls. And these free stalls need to be longer anyway because they're along an outside wall. So you kind of share the drover's lane space with some lunch space. And it's a lot easier than chasing those cows through an entire pen of robots at cow or a entire pen of cows in order to get those up to the robot. And so a couple of things I think really make cow management easy and are really kind of low cost. They just take some thought in how to lay out that facility. Another thing I think that's kind of nice, all of these cows in these automatic milking systems get so tame, but when you're doing uh, vet checks or you're breeding cows or doing other management interventions such as vaccination, I really do think headlocks are a nice way to manage cows in these particular systems.
Uh, one thing you're seeing a little bit more of in these are uh, special needs kind of a slash treatment area. Um, this is a guided flow system up on the top and you can see the sketch drawing. The cows go through this gate and then if they're a special needs cow, so a cow that maybe needs breeding or you're going to vet check or she's maybe sick, she gets sorted here to the left and ends up in these small free stalls, small rows of free stalls kind of behind the robots that then you can do that uh, intervention without interrupting and or going out into the main group of cows. Otherwise, again, she's sorted over here. Um, here's actually kind of a free flow system that the same thing. You can see a sort gate uh, right over here that the cows, as they leave the robot, if they have some special needs, they're sorted into this pen right here. Uh, now there's no cows in that pen, but they're sorted into that pen, and then you can do your management interventions there. As we act, asked producers about those and ones that had special needs pens, they weren't used a lot. You know, most of the time people tried to keep these cows in their main pen, but it's maybe something co to consider if you're um, if you're a large dairy or you like to manage your cows in that matter. Now uh, here's another one, again a free flow system that's kind of a modified free flow system. It's not really not a true free flow system. Can, you can see there are some finger gates here that get them into a pen, but there's really not a special sort gate that gets them into this pen in front of the robot. And you see down in the sketch drawing, that's a pen right here. Uh, kind of a commitment pen, but you can see when cows exit the robot, they go through the sort gate and either they're allowed to go back into the main pen of cows or they're sorted into this group right here with free stalls that you might put fresh cows in, again you might put treated cows in, you might put lame cows in, um, but just some options to think about if you so desire to manage your cows that way. Uh, another thing a few herds are trying, uh, they're putting in some pre-fresh feeders for their heifers. So this is a particular farm where you could have it in your close-up group and it may it may train those heifers a little bit earlier to go to pellets, to tick their head into an area where they're getting some pellets. So it possibly could minimize the number of fetch cows or decrease the number of fetch cow heifers that you have and train them a little bit faster. But just something to consider if you want to minimize labor and invest in something like that. When you look at labor comparison, uh, this is just one particular survey that was done looking at uh, milk, automatic milking system versus parlors dairies. And the only thing I'd like to point out on here is a wide variation both in automatic milking systems and parlor systems. So clearly automatic milking systems can be much more labor efficient than a parlor system, but at the same time a poorly designed automatic milking system uh, can potentially not save any labor or actually have more labor than um, a, a parlor system can have. Just moving on to some of the other keys to success is I think it's important to maybe enjoy technology. I don't think you really have to be necessarily great at it. We had a number of farmers that put in these technology or put in milking systems that really were not necessarily good with good with computers and they said you catch on really fast. These systems are very user friendly but in order to optimize a system yeah, I think you really do have to enjoy analyzing data and looking at how you can use that to, back, to best optimize your, your robot's performance. Another thing is I think it's important to focus on maintenance. As I had mentioned earlier that was one of the biggest questions we have. This equipment is very expensive it also get, it gets used a lot, so it's really not very surprising that your maintenance costs may be a little bit higher. But uh, farms, if they're really good with cows and get a lot of milk, they really didn't want to deal with robots at all. Just accept the fact if you're going to have dealers out a lot to do a lot of the minor maintenance kind of things, uh, you're going to have to pay somebody for that. We had a number of farms that over time they decided they were going to have somebody on that farm that really worked well with those robots and they worked with the dealer to understand what they could do. And my experience is most of the dealers really like that. They're very comfortable working with producers on, on what needs to be done on a regular basis. So, But I think it is important to maybe be prepared that you're going to possibly have higher repair costs than a, than a different milking system. Another key to success is dealer startup and dealer support at startup. There are some proven tactics that have shown to work very well. Work with your dealers, work with the robot companies, and make sure you implement those proven tactics. 
Uh, any favors that your friends might owe you, it's, I, I don't think I can emphasize you're not going to have too many people there at startup. It's a very stressful time, and so make sure you have many people there. And successful startups really does help minimize uh, financial stress. And most of the farms now have done a really nice job with startup. There's a lot of proven techniques that work very well. Um, Again, it's important to have excellent business and excellent management skills. Uh, I would challenge folks that it probably takes better management skills than a conventional system because you're really trying to encourage cow behavior versus chasing them somewhere. And I think over many of our traditional small farms that have put in that have put in automatic milking systems, you really need a little bit different of a mindset change when you go to these automatic milking systems. I think it's important to think about milk per robot per day and or milk per cow per day. I'm not trying to minimize that. But in order to do that, you really got to minimize the milk per minute of box time. So cow milking speed becomes very important, machine settings, maintenance becomes important. You really need to minimize that prep attach time. Now I know you need prep lag time for proper letdown, but you don't need a cow in there five minutes trying to attach. And of course the things that affect that are cow cooperation, uh, teat placement and udder balance. Crossed rear teats can be a real challenge. Reverse tilt udders can be a challenge. It's important to make sure you keep those udders singed. We were on one farm uh, where the unit actually attached to the hair on the udder it was a fresh cow that really had long hair and they hadn't had a chance to singe her yet. I think it's important to maybe not minimize free time but clearly optimize free time and then try to optimize re refusals because remember for, it, it maybe only takes five seconds for a cow to walk in that doesn't need to be milked and then get out of there but if you end up with five seconds at every single milking that a cow comes in, that's really one less cow that can be milked. Uh, cull rates, uh, that seemed to be concerned initially, but really you don't have to cull a lot of cows because you go into an automatic milking systems. The systems we have now can attach to a lot of challenging udder conformations. But as I mentioned earlier, cross real teeth Cross, cross rear teats are a challenge. Real deep udders are a challenge, particularly in jerseys that tend to have a little deeper udders. And then this rear teat, our reverse tilt, I'm sorry. And I think long term, we're going to be calling more and more cows for optimum robot performance. And I don't think that's really a bad thing. Some of these, uh, some of the farmers I talked to that have been in their systems for four or five years, uh, they'll say that they're probably culling half of their culls, so about half of the culls that they're making are maybe for robot adaptability, and that may be milking speed. Maybe you sell them to a neighbor if they milk too slow. It might be that they just take too long to attach. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think long term we're, we're going to be selecting cows for more robot compatibility, but just be prepared for that if you put in a robotic milking system. Here's a variation that we had on our farms, and you can see there's really a quite a variation in milking times from a minimum of four and a half minutes to six and a half minutes. And you can see, obviously, this farm can get a lot more cows, at least potentially could get a lot more cows through the milking system than the farm that averages six minutes. And so it really is important to be thinking about that as you move forward into these systems. In summary, the milking process really fits well with robotic technology. It's a very repetitive process. It's a very consistent process and cows like consistency. In our survey work, most of the current users are very satisfied with their decision. Uh, most of the producers we worked with were little smaller dairies that were trying to expand without hiring a lot of labor or maybe dairy producers that just wanted to be more a lot more flexible in their schedule. It really is important to look at a whole farm system to make the success work. You really do need to make so that cash flow works and be realistic with your numbers. Think about return on investment and then really remember it still takes really excellent management, particularly cow managed, to make, to make these systems the most successful. I'd like to acknowledge all the dairy producers and nutritionists that we worked with. They were very cooperative and just excellent. Uh, Laley and D. Lavelle, they were all the 
all the farms or all the farms and the robots on our program were Lely D. Lavelle, but I also had a lot of input from Gia and Bomatic. Uh, Dave Kamel at University of Wisconsin was great, helped us lined up farms and spent a lot of time with us on farms. And then the bottom list is all the students that helped collect the data, analyze some of the data, get it in order, and so I'd really like to thank them also.